but as we've been going through our series on anxiety. Was there any anxiety this week? In the news? You don't watch it. He's a smart man. Russia putting nuclear weapons out? Guy, there was a, a, a dissident was killed. And what about uh, what happened in Kansas City? Yeah. Did that create anxiety in our culture? People are wondering why, pointing fingers. We all have anxiety. And what we've been going through in this series is how do we handle anxiety? Because I am convinced down to the dirt in my toenails that God while there is anxiety, it's not to eat our lunch. He wants to use it in a marvelous way because even Jesus had anxiety. Remember uh, in the garden before he was arrested? Now that's anxiety. He, he was sweating drips of blood. That's anxiety. So we have someone who understands, our God understands anxiety. And part of this, and this is our working definition of anxiety, just as a reminder, is that life comes to us in all these pieces. It's disjointed. It doesn't seem like it fits. And anxiety is when we take on the responsibility to fix it. I've got to be the one to put the pieces together. You know, to find, when you put together a puzzle, what's the first thing you do? Start on the borders, right? Yeah. Find the corners, right? And we all have our own little thing. It's like when we play Monopoly, we all have that little clue inside of our head that says, this is how I'm going to win my strategy. And we all have a strategy for how to address anxiety. And what does it do? It eats a hole in our stomach. My dad, who I love greatly, uh, I remember a day like it was yesterday when I was a kid, he started bleeding. Blood was coming out of him. And we took him to the hospital. And they said, well, you've, you're, you have a bleeding ulcer. And so they took out somewhere between a third and a half of his stomach and sewed him up and life was good, right? A year later, he had another ulcer because it was addressing the symptom, but not the problem. You see, I come from a, I come from a family of world-class warriors. I've got advanced degrees in anxiety, okay? I have papers that have been published on anxiety, it seems like. But this is anxiety. And God says, Yes, life is in pieces, we live in a broken world, but there is a way to live life where I'm responsible for the pieces and putting them back together. And we're gonna look at someone who went through anxiety. And one of the big anxieties is moving, <laughs> right? Yeah. Tell me, what was the last time you moved? Three years ago, okay. Does this look at all familiar? Yeah. yeah, right? And was it, were you filled with joy and excitement and oh, it's so easy, right? It's like the song, it's so easy to fall in love. No, it's not. It's so easy to move. No, moving, you know, and is, does the anxiety differ between whether it's a short move or a big move? I think it does. I think longer moves are easier than shorter moves. Much easier. Because when you leave, there's no going back. Okay? When we came here from Arizona, that's like 2,000 miles, right? We packed up the, the truck and it came here and our house wasn't, uh, that we had purchased, the people, the husband was sick and we didn't want to make them move. So we moved, went into temporary housing. We threw everything in and that was a move. The three blocks 
that we had to move months later was much more difficult because, oh, I don't have to take care of that. I can just go back and I go back and go back and go back. And so uh, we're going to talk about somebody who started, we start learning about her as a, in a move. And her name is Naomi. And Naomi is a, one of these great Bible characters that she's there for like four chapters and she's gone. <coughs> and so in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So does that sound like anxiety? Famine. That sounds like anxiety. And so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while. They packed up the truck. They thought, yeah, this isn't going to be too long. We're just going to pack up the truck and go. And they went to Moab. Uh, so you think, well, that's not too bad, right? Just move. You know, we're going to pack up uh, like... Some people did during the pandemic, right? Some people packed up, left the city, and you know, some people got into an RV, some people went to the beach, some people went to the mountains, and they said, we're just gonna wait it out, right? Sounds nice, sounds easy. You know, I don't know whether they had enough Wi-Fi bandwidth in here when they took the move, but when they moved, they took everything and they went to Moab. Now you think, okay, they went from Bethlehem to Moab. That doesn't sound too bad, does it? It's two thousand over 2,000 miles. Okay, no Hertz truck, nothing like that. There were no charging stations for their electric vehicle along the way. They had, this, this was a big move, but they're taking it, well, it's, we're only going to go for a little while. It's going to be an extended vacation. And so they, they went, and Naomi is the wife, so she goes along, she's got a husband, she's got a couple of kids, right, a couple of sons. Life is good, and they got enough resources that they can leave. So they pick up and leave. And what then happens? Her husband dies and she was left with her two sons that's a that's a punch in the gut that's a punch in the gut but so then the two sons marry hey that's good right i mean now i got i got my two sons are here and they they marry some the local some locals and uh orpa and ruth and after, you know, they were going to go how long? Just a little bit? How long are they there now? Ten years. Ten years. That's, that's putting down some roots. That's putting down a foundation. And after about ten years, the sons die. Remember, she left with her husband and her two sons. And now, she doesn't have her husband, and she doesn't have her two sons, and she's left alone. All of these things come on top of us. Now, when tough things happen to you, and they all happen, by the way, in, they're, they're, you're in one of three places, okay? You're either in the place where something big and terrible is about to happen, okay? And I'm not saying it because I'm negative. This is just true. You know, something big and bad is about to happen. Second, something big and terrible is happening to you right now. Or third, something big and terrible is just stopping from happening. We're all in one of those three places. And we all try, you know, to protect ourselves, don't we? It's like this little video segment from someone who I've tried to model my life after when something big and terrible is coming. You know, Wile E. Coyote, one of the great philosophers of our day, you know, 
What does he do? How does he try to stop this big rock that's coming down? A little umbrella. Now, umbrellas are good on days, days like today, right? It's raining and the, the umbrella works. But an umbrella is not going to stop a big, heavy rock. And yet that's what we think. Oh, my, my solutions. I can fix things. Let me tell you, I'm a good fixer. I can figure things out and I can fix them. Whether they wake after work if, after I fix them is a, a second question, but, but he, that little umbrella, right? Oh, that'll, that'll help us. That'll protect us. No, it doesn't. And it crashed in on Naomi. She loses her husband. She loses her sons. She's in a strange place. It would be one thing if she was still in Bethlehem where she had family and friends, right? Most of you, I suspect, were not native Central Floridians. What is it like when life hands you a rock in the head when you don't know anybody around? We have been moving most of our adult lives, my wife and I, and we have a very different view of the world than people who grew up and lived in the same place. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just different. You know, we needed a babysitter because we had to go. There was no grandparents. There were no aunts and uncles. You had to find somebody. Where is the Burger King? One of the great questions of the day. Today, you wouldn't say that. Today, you would say, where's the Chick-fil-A? So, but you're on your own. She's all on her own. And she has these daughter-in-laws who are nice enough, but they're not hers. Isn't it? The people who are yours, when they help, doesn't that, isn't that different? When my brother died and my parents uh, turned to me to put their affairs in order. They, they hadn't had their will done since 1973, okay? And they had no other papers, no other of the documents that we now think of, you know, um, you know uh, living will and any of that kind of stuff. Who am I going to turn to? So I turned to someone I knew I could trust. I turned to my cousin. And she lovingly guided us through that process. But when you're out in a strange place and don't know anybody, it's really different. And that's where Naomi is. And so, you know, Naomi, look at how she feels. Look at how she says, you know, the daughter-in-law say, oh, we'll come with you. And what does she say? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you. Have you ever said that? Maybe you said it this week. It is so bitter for me than you. Why? Why? What is the source of her problem? What does she say? The Lord has turned against her. Oh, doesn't that just make your heart skip a beat? The God of the, her, she's saying she understands that God's in control and yet she says, the Lord has turned against me. I'll tell you, when you say that, when I have said this, it is the most lonely place in the world. I don't care if you're in Grand Central Station in New York and you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of people. You could be in a subway or in a train that's jammed like a sardine can. You're all alone. This is where she is. She is all alone. And even though her daughter-in-laws have said, you know, we'll come with you, that didn't comfort her because they weren't hers. And so she says to them, no, you guys go, you stay here, you got family here, because if you come with me, I ain't got nothing 
to offer you. So Ruth comes along and says these words that just, I have heard them in so many different settings. They are just so touching. Ruth replies, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Where your people will be my people and your God will be my God. She says, look, yeah, I'm from this area. I got it wired in here, but I want to go with you. I want to go. I'm, I am so connected with you, Naomi, that I'm ready to unplug my life, which this is all I've ever known, and to pick up and leave. I will go with you. And not only go with you, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to make my commitment to stay with you, even when things turn bad. I have a dear friend lives in another part of the country. He went through an incredibly difficult, painful, gut-wrenching experience in his life. His wife came to him and said, you're not the man I married. The daughter and I were out of here and abandoned him. Not Ruth. She says, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to go with you. And your people, your friends, your family are going to become my people, my friends, my family. And I'll show you. I've been so impressed by you and your relationship with Jehovah God, El Shaddai, the God who made everything, that I, he has become my God. And your God and my God, we will share him together. And so she accepts Ruth and they, these two women go back the 2,000 miles. They didn't have any men to protect them, you know. No highway patrol. When you're done, you pull off the side of the road and you hope that the animals don't get you. So they go back and... They arrive back in Bethlehem and everybody remembers Naomi. They say, hey, Naomi, what's up? We thought you, or we would say in Baltimore, sup, sup. You know, you said you were only going for a short time. You know, my digital watch says it's been more than 10 years. What happened? And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Why? Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I, when I left, I was what? Full. Do you remember? The moving truck was full of stuff. Now it's what? Empty. It's empty. The Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has, ooh, ooh. He has what? Afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune to me. She clearly understands that all of this was under the, the controlling hand of God. And you say, well, the name, she's a call me Mara. It's, you know anybody named Mary? The word Mary comes from this, it means bitter. That's what the name means. She says, call me bitter. You know, my name, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me like everything's good. Call me Mara because life really sucks. And everything has been taken away from me. And into that life, she returns with Ruth. They haven't got a thing. And so what happens? Ruth is younger and stronger, and in the culture of the day and the way God set things up, when people, when there was a harvest, they didn't pull everything up. They intentionally left some of it behind. It's called gleaning. 
And so Ruth went out into the fields and she started gathering what was left behind so that she could then maybe make a meal for her and, and Ruth. And it's not an accident that the field that she walks into is owned by a guy by the name of Boaz. And Boaz says, who's that chick down there? That's direct from the Hebrew. <laughs> and, you know, and they say, well, it's, it's Ruth. She came back with Naomi. And what does Boaz do? He doesn't know this woman from anybody. What does he say? He says, okay, you guys, you're the supervisors. You watch out for her. You protect her. And oh, by the way, you guys who are picking up and harvesting, leave some extra behind for her to pick up. He takes care of her. He invites her to come and sit and have a meal. This total stranger. How do you feel when a total stranger, when you're at a restaurant, especially fast food or something, they say, hey, do you mind if I sit down with you? You know, what's, what's that like? Uncomfortable? Uncomfortable? Yeah. yeah, who is it? What do they want? What are they selling? <laughs> you know, but he invites her and she, she has a, a meal and she has enough food to take home to Naomi. And this just tells me. Now, remember what Naomi said. Where did all her trouble come from? From the Lord. All of it, all the pain, all the agony. Now, do you know anybody who's bitter? Do you know anybody who's bitter and angry? What are they like? Are these the kind of people you want to have over for lunch? Are these the people you want to invite out for a cup of coffee? What do you want to do? Stay, away from them. Stay as far away from them as humanly possible. Right? You see them in Publix. Oh, hi, hi, go down. You know, oh, I'm going to buy some potato chips or something. You know, anything. Because you don't want to be near them. Because you know what's going to happen, right? You're going to get a snoot full of their bitterness. But what Listen to Naomi's words. She hears this and she says, the Lord bless him. That's Boaz. The Lord bless him, she says to her daughter-in-law. He, the Lord, has not what? Has not stopped showing kindness. Even through all of this pain, even through all of the bad news, even through everything that's been going on, yeah, she was upset, she was angry, and that, there's no problem with that. The problem is, is when we stay there. When we go down that hole and we stay there. Naomi didn't do that. She sees and she holds on. She says, God is still in control. God is still here. And there's more to it. God has not stopped showing his loving kindness. Maybe you've come to the place where life just seemed awful. And you thought, this is all that's, this is, the rest of my life is going to be like this. You ever, you ever tee up the life, your life like that? You wake up and say, yeah, remember what happened yesterday? Today's not going to be any better. It's only going to get worse. Not Naomi. When something good happens, she says, God is still with me. He hasn't abandoned me. And she then begins to do the process I call of connecting the dots. Because she says, oh, this guy Boaz, I know who he is. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. He's one of the people who can restore our fortune. She connects the dots. She says, God is in the process of restoring us, and I have hope. Yeah, there are dots that are out there. I don't know how to connect them. But God says, I know how to connect them, but it's going to take time. We have this mentality that says, you know, I watch TV 
And, and I like watching TV. I'm, we're watching, we're, we're binge watching the original Perry Masons, you know, and it's amazing. After 43 minutes, he always knows who did it. Every week for nine seasons, he never dropped the ball. And that's what we think life is like. But life isn't like that. There is no, you can't always depend that it say, well, you know, by the time I get to be certain, a certain age or a certain place in life, everything will be smooth. No. She connected the dots and had hope in God. And that gave her hope for the day. And as in the old hymn used to say, strength, hope for, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Great is thy faithfulness. She Ha, there's this guy, Boaz, and he's right there. And he's a guy who can help us. And so Ruth goes back. I don't know if you know the story. Uh, Boaz says, okay, I'm going to take care of you. And he uh, marries her. And they have a child. And the town just goes nuts. The town rejoices. Listen, you know, uh, the women said to Naomi, at when all this is done, praise be to who? The Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. The, God, the Lord has not left you without, why? Or may he become famous throughout the land. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. This guy who, yeah, is a distant relative, distant cousin, he's going to be the guy. And your daughter-in-law who loves you is better than seven sons. Yeah, you went through a really bad time and there's no denying it. But there is hope, and that hope comes in, in the Lord. And so she, Naomi hears this, she re, she's receiving this, she's seen God at work, and she then does the thing that every grandmother wants to do, which is what? Hold the baby, right? Took the child in her arms and cared for him. It's like... The Mar is it the maraschino or maraschino cherry? It's the red cherry. Whatever it is. It's that one. It's on top. You know, you gotta, you say, God has been good. She's got a grandson. And we thank God for that. Marion and I have a great blessing. And you know what that blessing is? We're never going to have grandchildren. Caught you off guard, didn't I? <laughs> we have three kids. None of, none of them are married. Physically, still possible maybe, but it's... The sands of time are moving on. And the question is, what are we going to do with the blessing that God has given us? You know, God deals us a hand. <clears throat> I grew up playing cards. God gives us a hand and he says, I want you to play your hand well. Our blessing is the blessing of no grandchildren. And you're scratching your head and thinking, Chet has lost it. Because we have grandchildren, and they are just such an excitement, such a blessing, such a joy. How could he say there's a blessing of no grandkids? Well, the answer is twofold. And I want to tell you about Marianne, who wanted grandkids in the worst possible way. 
as you can imagine, because she's a lovely, caring person. But she has come to the point in her life that says, I am not going to be bitter. This is the hand God has dealt us, so we are going to play it well. So Mary Ann, no grandkids to sow for. She sews for children in Africa. She made over 50 purses, I think I told you about, to send over there for kids, for girls, who to take care of themselves when they be, begin having their menstrual period. She tutors kids in Winter Haven a couple times a week in reading. Her kids have doubled, some more than doubled their vocabulary in the last couple of weeks because of her. You see, Naomi got dealt a hand. You and I have been dealt a hand by God. He says, it's not a hand of hate. It's a hand of joy. It's a hand of blessing. But you got to play it. And Naomi played it well. She played it well. And she then has this boy in her arms. And she had the, they named him Obed. And everybody knows Obed, right? You, you, everybody knows Obed, right? From the Bible, right? You got it, right? You know him. No. His name, I think this is it. Only time his name appears. Obed. That's a funny sounding name anyway. But Obed had a son. And his name was Jesse. And maybe some of you are saying, Jesse, Jesse, Jesse. I know that one. Who, 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 who was Jesse? Oh, Jesse was David's father. So Ruth becomes one of the four Gentiles in the lineage of Christ. And Naomi is brought into the lineage of Christ. What a blessing through all of this. Through all of this. But she didn't know that when it first started. She didn't know it in the middle because God has a storyboard behind it. Now, do you know what a storyboard is? Let me show you, what, this is what a storyboard looks like. This is a storyboard. Back uh, one night in uh, 1934, Walt Disney got, uh, took, told all of his uh, animators and staff, go out, get dinner, and come back. Nobody knew what was going on. And then when they got back for three hours, he acted out Snow White. And he, you know, used his voice. He changed his voice. He acted for three hours. He acted the whole story out. But you can't make a story. You can't make a motion picture from just some guy talking. That's what you do with a storyboard. You draw these individual pictures or cells and you say what's going to happen in them. You move them around. You, you move the pieces around and it tells the story. And then from this, the animators and the musicians and everybody take their cues. You see, there's a, you and I, there's a, there's a storyboard in heaven, in the mind of God. There's a storyboard. He knows all those individual pictures, but we're down here living it. So are we going to be like Naomi? Say, God, you got the cells, you got the pictures, you got the storyboard. You, I'm either going to trust you or I'm going to turn bitter. I'm either going to trust you or I'm going to walk around living a life of anxiety. Am I going to trust you? Am I going to have faith in you? And let you do what you do best. It's like the woman who was healed by Jesus in The Chosen. Why my garment? I'm sorry. I, I know I should have asked. But if, if you touched me, it would make you ritually unclean according to the law. I, I was sick. I was sick for 12 years. I bled and, and, and no one could stop it. But, but I believed if I could just touch a piece of your garment. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> Thank you. Who 
Who told you I could heal? A man from the pool. And he was right. The blood has ceased. My daughter. I'm no one's daughter anymore. Look up. Yes, you are. Daughter. It wasn't my piece of clothing that healed you. But it was instant. I felt it right away. I know. But it wasn't this. It was your faith. Teacher, she was bleeding so long. We can take her. She is clean. You have blessed me today. And I know. My daughter, I know it has been a fight for you for so long. You must be exhausted. Go now in peace. Your faith has made you well. Twelve years. Twelve years. Maybe you've been struggling with something for twelve years. For most of us, 12 seconds is intolerable. You know, coming home from Walmart the other day, and there's a car in front of me. The light turns green, and guess what they do? They do nothing. They do nothing. And, you know, it just rises up, almost uncontrollable. And yet for 12 years, your daughter, he calls her daughter. And did you hear what words she said? I don't, I'm nobody's daughter. Maybe you felt that. Maybe you felt like I'm nobody's daughter. I'm nobody's son. But in Jesus Christ, we are his sons and his daughters, adopted full and free by the shed blood of Jesus, who paid for all sin, past, present, future, no more, no more sacrifices. Yeah, life is going to hand us some tough stuff. It will, guaranteed. You can bet the bank on it. But God is looking and God says, I have, a pl I have plans for you. I have to prosper you, a plan and a hope and a future. Now, we all like to grab onto that prosper thing. He's like, yeah, yeah. We are guaranteed a prosper, prosperous life. We are in eternity. What happens here on earth? No guarantee. I don't care what anybody says. God's word says, that is our promise for eternity. But that we could have a life filled with hope, knowing that God's in control of even that, all this stuff. And you can make all the great plans in the world. And you can say, I'm doing everything God wants me to do. And yet sometimes, doesn't it just fall apart? You're doing something for his glory, for the good of people, and it just falls apart. That's what happened to William Borden. Does that name Borden sound familiar? The Borden Dairy. William Borden was a young man and he was the heir of the Borden fortune. And it was fortune, okay? I mean, we're talking Jeff Bezos, you know, Elon Musk kind of fortune. And what did he do? He walked away from it because he felt the call of God 
to become a missionary. Not a missionary in New York or Chicago. He wanted to go to outside Nowheresville in northern China to reach Muslims for Jesus. That's where he felt called. And so what does he do? He, he, was, he was at Yale. He graduated with honors. He goes to Princeton Seminary. He graduates with honors. He is at the top of his class. Everybody is saying, this guy is going to change the world because of how much talent he's so skilled. And so he, he graduated in, uh, in 1913. He graduated, no, in, in, in the end of 1912. He had graduated at the end of 1912. And he had plans. He said, well, I'm not going to go to China first. I'm going to go to Egypt because there I can learn Arabic. I can learn all sorts of stuff. I'm going to live with a family so I can hear the language and get very comfortable with it. And while I'm there, I'm going to hand out, you know, I don't know the language, but I'm going to hand out tracts. I'm going to hand out Christian material and talk to as many people as I can. He left at the end of 1912. In March of 1913, he contracted meningitis and died April 9th. He was on the field, if you he never made it on the field. He was still in training. At the end of his life, when he was too weak to talk, somebody came up to him and said, hey, this whole coming to Egypt thing was a mistake, right? I mean, look at it. And he grabbed a piece of paper and he wrote the words, no regrets, no regrets. I was like, I'd like to be able at the end of my life, be able to grab a piece of paper and write no regrets. He gave his entire fortune, over $800,000 to Christian missionaries. But there's another guy I want to tell you about. Another guy, another nobody. Well, the, you know, William was a somebody, right? He had all this money. I want to tell you about a, a guy who, a kid who was a nobody. You know, he grew up in Texas and he just thought life was against him. Okay? He stuttered. He, stu he couldn't put two words together. And he made it to high school and the, there's this guy, his name was, uh, I'm get his name, uh, he was the drama teacher, Mr. Richard Neiman, Nemi. Nobody knows Richard Nemi, right? You, you, there's not a name, right? Nobody knows him. Richard Nemi calls this guy in, he said, who's the head, he's, Richard's the head of the drama department, and says to this kid who stutters, okay, I want to work with you. I want to work with you so you lose your stutter and so that you can be the lead part in the senior play when you, before you graduate. And the kid just is like, you've got the wrong guy because nobody listens to me. And yet Richard saw something in this guy. And he worked with him through the d days and the summers. And when it came to the senior play, he had the lead role. He had earned the lead role. Finished up school, went to work in a metal factory making drill bits. How's that for a lifetime, right? A life's work. He went into the Marines uh, and while on the island of Okinawa, it's as if God told him, I want to do something special with your life. So he, went to, he came back home, went to seminary, and maybe you've heard of this guy. Maybe you've heard of this guy. His name, this is the high school that he went to in Texas. Again, not special. But Chuck Swindoll was that kid, stutterer. Millions of people have listened to the thousands of his sermons around the world. He's on over 2,000 radio stations. He's published 70 books. This stutterer. Now, the interesting thing about this whole story 
if you, if you Google Chuck Swindoll, you're going to find a bazillion pictures. There is not a single picture that I could find of Richard Nimi. Not a single one. And yet, everything turned on that encounter. Now, probably, just probably, okay? I don't put anybody down. But there's probably no Chuck Swindolls in, in this room, okay? Probably. I know this one's not. But we can all be a Richard Nimi. We can all find that person, that stutterer, that person who needs encouragement and, and, and build them up. We all can do that. So the question is, like, remember what Chris was saying, are we going to be comfortable Christians that just sit on our duffs? And, you know, we, we don't have, uh, we, we, we in our house, we have graduated, okay? We no longer have the manual recliners, we have the electric ones. You know, don't ask us what we do when the power goes off. But, well, I'll tell you what happens. Our generator kicks in. That's why we got a generator. So, no, it's you. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know the future. But you and I have the absolute golden opportunity to encourage people, the people we meet. There's not a person in here who can't be a Richard Nini. Not a single one of us. There is no one who can portray the love of God like you can to the person you meet. So if you have seen and heard the love of God, that Jesus would die for you and eliminate all of your sin, so there's no more sacrifice, then the time is now to start being the people of God that he wants us to be. For us to reach out to the people. Richard Nimi called to Chuck and said, I want you to meet me in my room after school. And Chuck thought, well, he wants me to copy some things. I love mimeographs. I still have the smell of mimeographs in my fingers. <laughs> You know, to mimeograph something or to build a set. And he said, no, I want you to be the lead role in the senior play. You could do that. I can do that. Because God has, has died for us and risen from the dead and given himself for us so that we can give ourselves for others to bring glory to the God who loves us. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, I'm so thankful that you love us, that your love is never ending, and that in Jesus Christ we are made new. Oh God, forgive us for sitting around. It is time, it is the day, it is the hour, it is the minute to begin getting up and being your people. Oh God, use us in extraordinary ways, not up front, but beside and behind people to bring your name into the front. In Jesus' name, amen.